From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. U.S. government bans Kaspersky and sanctions 12 executives. Evolve Bank confirms data breach, undermining Lockbit's Federal Reserve claim. And the U.K.'s largest nuclear site pleads guilty over cybersecurity failures. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. And now we're ready for some insight, opinion, and expertise on all of these from our guest, Jim Bowie, the CISO over at Tampa General Hospital. Jim, know you're a busy guy. Thank you so much for making the time and being here. Thanks. It's good to be here. Yeah, I cannot wait to get into these stories. You were you were helping uh, curate them this week for the week in review, so I'm really excited for some of your thoughts. A lot of a lot of big stories, a lot of big angles. I want to get your thoughts on. Before we get into those, though, I have to thank our sponsor for today, Prelude Security. You're 30 minutes away from peace of mind. Join us on YouTube Live. Do so. Go to CISOseries.com. Hit that old events drop down and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. You can click on it to join us. If you are in our Discord for Super Cyber Friday, we're going to be posting links there as well. So make sure you check those out and be sure to contribute your comments. We want I want Jim's thoughts, but I also want your thoughts. I see you, CCL, Kevin Farrell, incredulous core date in there as well. Let me hear your thoughts as we're going through this. Would love to get some more. we got about 20 minutes, though, so let's just jump right in. First up here, the U.S. bans Kaspersky and sanctions 12 executives. These sanctions were issued by the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Asset Control. We know it as good old OFAC and pretty much freezes all their property and interests. These actions come on the heels of an announcement made by the government on June 20th regarding a ban on selling Kaspersky antivirus software due to it being a Russian organization. The ban starts on July 20th, and software updates to its U.S. customers will be prohibited on September 29th. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said now would be a good time for companies to find an alternative to Kaspersky for their security needs. I'm just going to say sound advice there. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Raimondo. But that U.S. individuals and businesses can continue to use or have existing Kaspersky products and services and are not violations of the law. So you will not go to jail for keeping using things that aren't going to get software updates. So Jim Kaspersky has, uh, you know, alternated over the years between, you know, having some good collection of researchers to being a Russian organization at a time when associating uh, with uh, uh, in a Russian organization, not exactly uh, great optically. So why now do you get a sense that this is part of a strategy about maybe eliminating risk, maybe some new evidence came to light, or is this, hey, it's election season, maybe this is just some good press? I think you nailed it at the end there. I think it's election season. Uh, if they were going to do this, and for those at home, uh, if you remember in 2017, it came to light that uh, the Russian government somehow used Kaspersky, or they were in league with Kaspersky to take NSA tools, hacking tools. I would imagine they would have done it then. They did ban the the computer use are on mm -hmm. government networks. So I thought that was the end of it. But I think I think you're right. This is saber rattling. I was actually surprised. I was watching last night the debate purely because I thought they'd bring this up because the timing of it lined up. I was like, hey, they did this two days before. This week's, hey, we're tough on Russia. Here's what I've done. Uh, I don't think this protects the private world any more than it was four days ago. Uh, I think it's saber rattling. Well, and I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is any security professional worth anything would have already yeah, made this decision, yeah. you know, ten, almost 10 years ago now at this point. Yeah, if Kaspersky made it through your risk assessment uh, profile and you give it a thumbs up, you may want to reevaluate your GRC team. <laughs> <laughs> some uh, some good thoughts. So yeah, we will uh, uh, we will see if that does play out though in the political season. Uh, it's a really good point. I didn't even think uh, of that coming up. Um, I just thought maybe you were a masochist or something for watching the debate, but that's a separate issue. Yeah. Uh, next up here, Evolve Bank confirms data breach undermining Lockbit's Federal Reserve claim. Arkansas-based Evolve Bank and Trust confirmed this week the theft of customer information, which has now been posted on the dark web. Bank representatives say the information involved PII, but not financial or banking information. So just, just your personal information. Don't worry about it. This appears to be a job pulled off by uh, attackers affiliated with Lockbit, which itself had claimed to have breached the U.S. Federal Reserve. In fact, among the documents was a press release about the Federal Reserve enforcement action against Evolve Bank alongside uh, regarding deficiencies in anti-money laundering controls and risk management practices. So, Jim, the story has a touch of the more you look, the more you find, given that Evolve isn't your average mom and pop bank, 
many of the customers uh, whose data was stolen are startups and many of them financial companies at some point, a lot of fintech in there. It also has the Lockbit angle, a group seemingly uh, uh, on, on the rise again after their supposed shutdown earlier this year. Uh, what's your take on this? Uh, my take is Lockbit's good hype. Good hype, man, right? <laughs> uh, they posted that and within two hours, I had to call my leadership my senior leadership, because I knew that was going to hit Forbes and whatever, and they were going to be like, what's going on? And it had nothing to do with our company. We're a health organization, right? Uh, and I was like, they're, they could be lying. You don't know. Just take it with a grain of salt till there's some proof. And as, as it turned out the way it is, actually, VX Underground had a good theory that they probably don't speak English. They saw a document that said Federal Reserve on it and got a little oh, yeah. happy. Right. <laughs> and if it happened to be true, kind of beside the point right. then at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. And since I, they've, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I'm just wondering. So that's an interesting perspective. I, I didn't even thought about that kind of the wasted effort or like the, I, I don't want to call it wasted due diligence, right? Because you do want to look into these kind when these claims kind of come up. But I, I'm wondering how much is that a, a factor in like time wasted where we can't trust these threat actors? We have to assume everything, especially from Lockbit, who has a track history, seems to be credible. Uh, it, it's a lot of time wasted. I have a couple people uh, dedicated purely on our team to, to cyber threat intelligence, and that's all they do all day is sift through this and wait to see and set up alerts. And uh, it's it's a it's a good chunk of of your FTEs. Um, but it's important because if I don't get ahead of it uh, to my senior leadership, my other peers in my organization, they will lose confidence. And if I can say ahead of time, hey, this is a problem. You're going to see this. It doesn't affect us. It does affect us. It helps a lot with the trust. All right, next up here, UK's largest nuclear site pleads guilty over cybersecurity failures. The company that manages the Sellafield nuclear site in northern England has pleaded guilty to three criminal charges over cybersecurity failings. Sellafield is no longer a functioning nuclear plant, but is currently housing more plutonium than any other location on Earth, and also has a number of facilities for things like nuclear decommissioning and waste processing and storage. As such, it's considered one of the most complex and hazardous nuclear sites in the world. Uh, I, I would assume most nuclear sites fall into complex and hazardous <laughs> to some degree. The criminal charges focus on failures to comply with approved security plans between 2019 and early 2023, which is a long time. In admitting these failures, Sellafield Management is also denying reports from The Guardian that the facility might also have been compromised by hacking groups linked to both China and Russia. So, Jim, basically every sentence in the story has something more that I don't want to hear. Uh, there was a story in the BBC from December of last year that shows the chief of security, Ewan Hutton, defending his actions while still admitting that there were problems like cracks in an open air pond full of radioactive sludge. But that, hey, they're keeping an eye on it. Yeah. Again, not great. I know this is, you know, this is a UK story. This plant is in the UK, but every country seems like they're having similar types of issues. Do we wait until we get another Three Mile Island or, or Love Canal before acting here? No, uh, this is, I was, my shock was the same as yours reading that article. And I was just hoping at the end, we got some Ninja Turtles out of it or something. <laughs> right? uh, that's the only positive that could have come out of it. But uh, it, you have this problem in our infrastructure here. You've got the, uh, is it the Huey, Huey, I can never pronounce them, that are, are deep into our infrastructure. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You've got Volt Typhoon. They were going to shut off. All of our infrastructure or communications once China, if China decides to invade Taiwan, you've, we've got the same massive problems here. We've got, uh, I was dealing with a peer of mine and I was talking to at another energy company and they were talking about how they use torrents to update their their firmware on their devices. And I'm like, ah, it just, we're, we're way behind in this legacy equipment. There's two, there's two industries that are just commonly getting hit and that's healthcare and it's uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, utilities and it's because of legacy stuff like that and we're just going to keep having that problem and i don't know the answer on modernizing because they've shut down all the programs for the most part yeah it's it's that problem of needing to you know th these are essential services right like power is essential right uh health is essential and it, it what i mean it, it, that leads into a whole other uh, uh realm of uh you know, inheriting technical debt, right? Like taking on technical debt so you can keep operations moving over the long term. And then that turns into this legacy long tail uh, where we're dealing with, you know, trying to network SCADA systems that were never designed for it yeah. and, and building on all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it really, I, I mean, at some point, you, I would have thought it was the colonial pipeline attacks, right? That would have been 
the definitive wake up call to be like, we need to, you know, uh, take this on. I, like you said, some of the programs for this, uh, have gone away. I know CISA is making a lot of initiatives yes. to, to sis- more systemically address this, but it does feel like, uh, you know, drops in a bucket at this point. Yeah. It's, it's just hard. You've got, like you said, you, you know, you nailed on the head. You've got these systems that weren't designed to do these things that weren't supposed to live for 50 years. You don't have anyone making new systems to replace it. Uh, and you've got to have access to do the things they need to do. It's, it's a real tough problem. At some point, maybe we'll run out of uh, like uh, quarter inch floppies and then we'll all be forced to uh, move on, at least for, for some of the critical infrastructure stuff. So here's hoping. All right, before we move on, now we have to spend a word and a moment with our sponsor for today, Prelude Security. 30 minutes or less isn't just for pizza delivery. It can be how fast you know you're protected against the latest threats. Visit PreludeSecurity.com forward slash threats for a free delivery of threat hunting queries, detection rules, and security tests based on any piece of threat intelligence. We can review listeners can head to PreludeSecurity.com forward slash threats to upload their intelligence and know with certainty. That's P-R-E-L-U-D-E security.com slash threats. Next up here, fresh move it bug under attack just hours after disclosure. A new high severity vulnerability in move it transfer software is being actively exploited just hours after it was made public. Researchers determined that attackers could exploit the bug by using a forced authentication attack with a malicious SMB server and a valid username, or by impersonating any user on the system by uploading their own SSH public key to the server without logging in, then use the key to authenticate. Admin should move to patch versions as soon as possible. Uh, uh, I guess table stakes advice there for, for everybody. But Jim, I'm curious, what do you make of these two attack vectors? Are they original or do they reveal new flaws in the design of move it? Uh, I, I'm probably pretty sure they've been there. I don't think they're a, a new thing. I just think they found it. They took it off to give them credit initially. Uh, if y'all are move it customers, you would have gotten emails for weeks before this saying, Hey, patch, 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 patch. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have to give them credit on that front. What I don't give them credit for is they, <laughs> they thought it was a 7.4 and it was this particular part. But once there's blood in the water, people start looking at things and then it had to escalate it to 9.1 when they realized there was another third party component. So the patch actually doesn't work. Uh, to mitigate the problem. So census actually pulled a report and I think it was 24, 2,700 instances online before this was released. And then once they came out and said, hey, you need to patch. Now there's only 1,800 two days later. So people are listening to this one because of last year's instance with the Clop ransomware group um, that hit a lot of us. I'm imagining all 1,800 of those are probably healthcare too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I know I've uh, received my fair share of uh, uh, move it disclosures uh, over yeah. the past couple of months here, for sure. CCL in the chat had a question here. Didn't they try to implement their own version of SFTP or SFTP? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure on that, CCL. I will have to look into that. I don't want to I don't want to overspeak uh, uh, the case for for move it here. Um, but yeah, definitely. It's one of these things where I feel like this is this is almost on the level of like a like we hear about new specter level vulnerabilities. Obviously, like this is way more practical and way more in your face. I feel like we're just going to be hearing about this because there's such inertia to move off of of these types of platforms that we're just going to be hearing about this for years to come. Yeah, it's a it's a problem, and in the same way that faxing is a problem, right? It's an <laughs> you would think if we're not using FTP, we're using faxing in healthcare, and you've got to move on to something I don't know, crazy new secured connections. Uh, but uh, it's. It goes back to legacy stuff, and it has to be out there. It has to be exposed, and uh, you ha- you better have your lockdown, you know, IPs right and sourced right, not just to any any rule. All right, uh, our next story here: DHS aims to streamline clearance approvals to increase headcount. As lawmakers at a House hearing pointed at the federal government's cumbersome uh, pointed out the gov- federal government's cumbersome hiring process that has undermined its ability to recruit cyber talent. CIO Eric Heisen responded that the DHS uses a multi-pronged approach included through its cybersecurity talent management system and by assessing clearance protocols, but that it's looking to reduce requirements and expand the use of interim clearances at both the secret and top secret level. This solution is just one of many proposed to assist with the estimated 500,000 vacant cyber-related jobs in the country. So Jim, you know, very much a tricky situation here. Understaffed, you need to be like, there's a, there's a recognized need that we need to staff up, bring in talent. You don't want to 
have you want qualified people, but there is a clearance process. I, I guess how do we fill this in without lowering the bar too far? I'll I'll counterpoint on that. I think you your bigger national security threat is not filling these positions. Uh, ah, okay. The issue, and I was reading deep into this because I I can turn your twenty minute show into a four hour show <laughs> about this. But the the lowering the barrier to entry to cybersecurity, the the gatekeeping of I'm going to light Twitter on fire here. You don't need a bachelor's degree to do this job. You don't need a four year degree. You can have great programs. There are great programs out there that do it. Uh, but if you give me a talented smart, capable person, we can teach them this stuff. It's not rocket science in the 99% of the cases. Don't get me wrong. There's great people out there doing all kinds of crazy research that's needed in that point. But for what CISA and DHS is talking about here, you need people that can do vol management, help with reporting. You, you know, All that is trainable by just competent people. Um, and apparently I just lost power. So oh, no. we'll figure that out. Um, all right. Yeah. But... Uh, it's it's a problem not to do it if I and they don't they're not restricting people from the uh, ability to if they have a they still need to exercise classified materials they're still getting clearances if they are not then they don't need it and that's what this is yeah and I know they've they've started to do work because uh, I have uh, some family that's worked in the federal government for years and I know that they have like the there are very strict requirements about like you were saying, degrees needed to obtain, uh, uh, you know, certain positions, certain levels uh, within any different agency. I remember my mom laughing because someone got up to a higher grade because they had a master's in music and they're in the Department of Justice, but they had a master's degree, so they qualified for this position. So I know there's been some work uh, both on the military and in the uh, civilian side to uh, uh, make those softer, right? Not make those as hard requirements, but specifically with cyber. Um, but yeah, the, I, I hadn't thought about that in terms of like just looking at purely at a as a as a risk proposition, right? The risk of not being properly staffed versus you know the risk of an insider you know threat of someone not being cleared or something like that. I think that's a really interesting way to think about that, and I would expect nothing less from a CISO. Yeah. Uh, but I will. Uh, I won't let you sit in the dark here too long, Jim. So we will uh, finish up with our last story here: CD Clay global outage caused by black suit ransomware attack. In an update to one of last week's biggest stories, Bleeping Computer has learned that the operation behind CDK Global's massive IT outage and disruption to car dealerships across North America is Black Suit, an operation launched in May 2023, and which is believed to be a rebrand of the Royal Ransomware Operation, and therefore the direct successor of the Conti Cybercrime Syndicate. It's just a wonderful cybercrime family, really, at this point. If you read some of the dark web monitoring accounts on X, you'll see that Black Suit has been very busy of late. So, Jim, uh, CDK is starting to look like this season's version of Change Healthcare, but I have, a, I have a specific question here. CDK is warning that threat actors are contacting dealerships posing as CDK agents or affiliates in order to gain access to their systems. Kind of a perfect social engineering situation, you know, appearing to be the helpful, uh, uh, you know, a company spokesperson helping you out in distress. As a CISO, how do you prepare for this, especially with such a disparate kind of dealership structure that's just kind of inherent with how those those businesses work? And this one's tough when you have the, the, like you said, thousands of different dealers, different organizations. But as a CISO dealing with this change, like we had to with the healthcare change healthcare incident, you have to get ahead of things. You have to really hope that your senior leadership's with you and communicating, uh, allowing you to communicate out. I went to similar situation as this, the whole the whole streamline of our revenue stream was down because of the change healthcare, as well as most of America. Uh, and these car dealerships are dealing with that same problem. You need to, you're going to have panic. You're going to have a need. Anyone who's offering a branch, they're going to be all over it. And so that's where that social engineering comes into play. And that's where you as a CISO and you as a cybersecurity team need to get in front of your CEO and CIOs and be like, I need to meet with all these, these different teams and put these communications out. Like, do not trust anyone uh, do not give them access. It's not us. And, and that's just the only way you can really handle that part. All right. Well, before we get out of here, I wanted to uh, uh, recognize we had a comment in from Kevin Farrell kind of about uh, our, uh, our federal hiring uh, discussion that says they should be able to streamline the clearance process for applicants who currently hold public trust clearances for sure. That's his totally unbiased opinion. So thank you, uh, Kevin, for that. Love, love uh, uh, that thought. And yeah, uh, I think there's just a lot of I mean, there's a lot of 
I don't want to call that a little thing, but there's a lot of things that you could do to, I feel like, make a big difference. Of course, any big bureaucracy, turning a battleship, uh, roll out your metaphor of choice, but uh, uh, speed and alacrity, not exactly the federal government's M. Oh, before we get out of here, uh, Jim, uh, was there any story here that uh, was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you this week that just kind of caught your attention? Uh, the eye roller was locked bit claiming to hack the Federal Reserve, uh, but it was important to to look at um, on that front. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, we had uh, just uh, a few hours ago, we had kind of the uh, uh, the revelations that uh, Nobelium, uh, and Co- aka Cozy Bear, has been attacking uh, Team Viewer Two. I know we'll be getting some coverage on that on day or on uh, cybersecurity headlines. So look for that. Lots of listen. It's it's rough out there for uh, <laughs> using third party uh, software. It's 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 a it's a rough uh, time out there for you. Uh, Jim, is there anywhere uh, we can send people to follow you on cyberspace? You had some great insights today. Really appreciate it. Where can people follow you online? Uh, LinkedIn is the best place if you want to reach out. And if you have any questions or follow up on this, just say, hey, we talked on the show or I saw you on the show and I'll happy to get back to you. If you're a CISO on LinkedIn, it's all vendors trying to sell you stuff. So please differentiate yourself <laughs> or else I won't know it was you. Yeah, I just want five minutes of your time. Don't worry, yeah, Jim. Yeah, exactly. Don't worry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jim Bowie, the CISO at Tampa General Hospital. Staying with us in the dark. Shout out to your uh, uninterrupted power supply. Uh, thank you. Holding it, holding it down down there. That's, uh, that's yeah. pretty impressive. Uh, uh, and thank you also uh, to uh, Jay Walter Smith for also rolling your eyes uh, at the uh, at the whole um, uh, Lockbit uh, claim on the Federal Reserve. Hey, listen, uh, you can't blame him for trying, I guess. I mean, you can blame him for like everything else. They're, they seem like they're horrible people. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> glad to see you're not alone on that one, Jim. Thanks also to our sponsor for today, Prelude Security. You're 30 minutes away from peace of mind. Visit them at PreludeSecurity.com slash threats. P-R-E-L-U-D-E security.com slash threats. Thanks also to our audience today. Uh, We had some people on LinkedIn and YouTube getting in, leaving some comments. Always appreciate everybody coming in, throwing some questions, some insight, and their own expertise. We are here every single Friday, uh, except for next Friday, which is we're taking off for the 4th of July. So if you you could still show up, on YouTube uh, and follow the CISO series. We just won't be broadcasting. That's okay. We'll be back the week after that, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Most Fridays, you can find us here. We always have a fun time, but you can still get your daily news fix, except for 4th of July, cybersecurity headlines every day, six minutes. We'll get you all cut up. A lot of exclusions, 4th of July. We're celebrating America. I hope you are too, if you're in the US. If, If not, just have a fun 4th of July. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino, reminding you, to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 